Good morning, everybody. Um, so we are going to get started. Um, before we have uh, Dr. Rolfson presenting, um, I just wanted to take a minute to go through some uh, virtual rounds etiquette. Um, so we will uh, once again ask you to um, pose all of your questions in the question box. But feel free to chat amongst yourselves if you like in the chat box. But if there are questions for Dr. Rolfson, as we're going along, you can go ahead and type in the questions and, um, and then we'll just uh, summarize at the end and, and he'll answer as many as possible. So um, today's uh, virtual medical grand rounds are on frailty inclusive care during COVID-19. Um, Dr. Daryl Rolfson will be presenting, and I'll just give you a little uh, background on Dr. Rolfson. Um, as most of you know, he graduated in medicine at the University of Alberta in 93 and completed residencies in internal medicine and geriatric medicine in 1998. He's currently professor in the Department of Medicine. Um, he's a specialist in geriatric me medicine with a research interest in frailty, especially in, um, in the geriatric population. Um, in 2001, Dr. Rolfson developed the Edmonton Frail Scale, or EFS, which is internationally recognized as a multidimensional frailty measurement. Um, so I guess without further ado, I think Dr. Rolfson is ready. So we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks. All right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone out there in uh, Zoom land. Um, I probably know many of you, might not know all of you. Hope you're all coping well. I'm here to talk about frailty inclusive care during uh, COVID-19. Um, so as uh, Norman mentioned, I was the lead author in development of the Edmonton Frail Scale. Um, it is available for licensing, so it's an important disclosure. Um, for uh, large research organizations, healthcare organizations, it is available for licensing with a fee. And all the uh, fees, 100% uh, of them, are retained by the University of Alberta. Objectives today are first to provide an overview of frailty, including its definition, measures, application across the continuum of care, uh, to demonstrate how frailty can add context to advanced care planning and goals of care discussion. Next, to explore the role of frailty measures in defining acute care approaches to the COVID-19 crisis. And finally, to illustrate how to deliver frailty inclusive care, avoiding some of the hazards of uh, labeling, exclusion, and other things. So we'll start off, and I think it's worthwhile to start with a definition, especially with a topic such as frailty, which has been um, laden with problems with definitions over at least two decades. Um, one of the, the classic uh, sort of controversies is whether it's a state or whether it's a syndrome. My definition is that it's both. It's a state of exaggerated vulnerability. It's manifest as a multidimensional syndrome, especially evident in the, evident in the context of stress. And of course, it is associated with several uh, important adverse outcomes. One simple way to uh, demonstrate it is to compare a person who is living with frailty, one who is not. Um, you can see here that uh, in both cases, they start in a state of independence without disability. Um, the state of frailty may be quiet at the beginning, but in the context of a stressor that comes along, let's say acute critical illness um, or surgery or some other stressor, um, the underlying vulnerability becomes more evident. Um, and uh, that person who's more robust uh, may, like the person with, who is more frail, um, decline in function while sick, but they're expected to uh, bounce back. So I'm going to unpack that definition over the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, the first is that frailty is a state of exaggerated vulnerability. Let me talk a little bit about deficit accumulation and one scale that we'll focus on today, the clinical frailty scale. I think most of us understand that as we age, as we move along in life, we acquire problems, um, challenges, things that we, uh, we sort of live with, um, but we have coping skills. We have that resilience that allows us to uh, sort of live with these problems. Um, in the world of frailty, we call these deficits, but this just illustrates the, the point that as people get older and older, they live with more and more chronic comorbidities. Um, you can see if you look at the dotted line at just even starting at the age of 60, um, the proportions of uh, people that have uh, between zero and more than eight different uh, disorders at one time. Um, deficit accumulation was uh, 
really um, brought forward with an, an index called the Frailty Index. It was from the Canadian Study on Health and Aging, in which they defined 70 different items. Don't bother reading them, but they are not just comorbidities. There's also uh, functional aspects. There's even family history and different things that came from the, the history itself. And in this model, um, the way that a frailty index was calculated is simply to define the denominator, in this case, 70, um, apply it to a person or a population, count up the number of deficits that are present, and then that becomes your numerator. So the index is between zero and one, with a 0.21 or higher uh, being uh, in the range of frailty. Um, deficits are defined as those things that accumulate with the age, um, they uh, accumulate in a non-linear fashion, accelerating over time regardless of age. Um, they're unpredictable and random or stochastic. And uh, they, they never saturate. It's impossible to acquire all 70 in this last example. Um, in fact, there are people that can live with up to 70% uh, or a frailty index score of 0.7 um, in some populations. Some ways you might sort of say these people are prob probably, yes, they're frail, but there's something about them that allows them to live with that many deficits. So it sort of introduces this paradox that that person who is more frail may also have some characteristics that make them even more resilient. Now, what about this uh, aging quickly phenomenon? Well, if we start at sort of the two o'clock point on this uh, uh, diagram, people are accumulating deficits gradually over time and then moving counterclockwise, uh, to the extent that they have these deficits, they no longer have uh, assets um, or ways that they can sort of respond to new stressors. And to that extent, they have a diminished re repertoire of homeostatic responses. This increasingly exposes them to new stressors. They fail to um, withstand environmental stressors and um, then they, the accumulation of deficits accelerates. Um, so this is sort of one way to understand how it is that a person may from one year to the next appear to be not aging and then all in one year it all seems to change. Um, that accumulation of deficits uh, accelerates very quickly, they age quickly. Another way to understand this is through something called Little's Law. It's a very interesting thing, it doesn't come from uh, healthcare but it can be applied very well. Uh, whether we want to understand it in terms of healthcare systems, um, ecosystems, you name it. But the concept here is that we have a number of deficits and here we'll apply it to an individual that they're accumulating over time. How do we understand the factors that influence the number of deficits that they're living with or um, the number of deficits that then accumulate and overwhelm them? Well, it's understood in terms of the intensity of the stream of environmental stressors that come to them, lambda, and the average recovery time. So how long can, or how quickly can they resolve or recover from each of those deficits as they, as they come? This uh, is something that should resonate with most people on frontline uh, clinical work. Um, people will come in and they'll acquire one new problem and another new problem and so on. And if the, the number of new problems overwhelms, um, then uh, that person will decline. But if they can actually resolve the problems quickly enough, um, then they can move it towards a period of recovery. So hopefully, as I describe this in describing frailty, um, it's occurred to you that this is a model that applies fairly well to our, our current pandemic as well, when you think about deficits as cases in a population, and how uh, we talk about um, or not, and, and how quickly people are acquiring cases, or how quickly a, a population acquires cases, and also how quickly we can socially distance and uh, change that or not, so that we can recover more quickly. Now, here's the first scale. I'm gonna talk about two, two to remember today. It's called the clinical frailty scale. This is one that is worth knowing about. Uh, you can access it. I'll tell you about that towards the end. And you can see here that if you're doing a, a clinical assessment, which we're all doing, you can very quickly um, open up this scale and point to one of these numbers. So if you've taken a history, done a bit of a physical, know a little bit about the person's background, you'll be able to reliably um, say that you would rate them as a three, four, five, six, whatever it might be. So you can see how quick and convenient this is. The clinical frailty scale is very well suited to um, emergency environments, acute care environments, critical care environments. And in fact, that's where a lot of the testing has been done for this particular scale. 
So moving now to frailty, how it's manifest as a multidimensional syndrome. Here I want to talk about geriatric syndromes, and I'm going to talk about the Edmonton Frail Scale. I think you'd agree that human behaviors often require a higher level of integration, um, whether it means organizing ourselves to eat, to remain continent, um, to manage our medications, to perform each of our activities of daily living, to uh, keep our uh, bipedal locomotion working as it should. Um, all of these are examples of behaviors that require higher level integration. And in fact, a person may acquire deficits, but they may have um, ways to compensate for that and maintain their abilities in all of these higher level areas. But um, over time, as I mentioned before, as, as this uh, sort of frailty pattern emerges, and there's this acceleration and less reserve capacity, a person is more prone to present illness through these same state variables. So whereas in younger, more robust individuals, we often care about the classic vital signs, in the older age group, these are the ways that illness presents, whether it's delirium, falls, immobility, incontinence syndromes, dehydration, nutritional crises, and a decline in function. So these are good clues um, to recognize acute illness. These are, this is not necessarily the, the state of the individual, um, but this is the manifestation and uh, we can work backwards to say, if they're manifesting illness in these ways, it may be that they have some underlying syndromes of frailty for us to discover. Um, an example here is with delirium work that was done by Sharon Enoway back um, over 20 years ago, where we recognize that delirium um, can be understood both from the perspective of uh, the precipitant. We always think about medications, we think about acute illnesses and so on, but it's also about the predisposition. What is it that makes that person more likely to develop delirium? Um, in, in the older population, uh, there's that higher level of, level of vulnerability, which uh, we would call frailty. So a person who is more frail um, may be developing delirium with a very much less noxious insult. Um, the same model is um, understood with other uh, geriatric syndromes, such as falls, uh, acute urinary incontinence, and uh, nutritional crises. And so geriatric syndromes become a very useful phenotype for frailty. Um, not only do they, when we see these as a whole, we start to think about frailty, but specifically when a person presents with some of these atypical disease presentations, that's a clue that they may have a particular system of vulnerability. So that helps us understand that frailty is indeed multidimensional. Uh, each person with frailty will have their own particular constellation of vulnerabilities. And it's with that in mind that multidimensional frailty measures um, exist. There's several out there. The Edmonton Frail Scale is the one that we developed here locally. Um, people like uh, some of you will remember me too, Majumdar, Ross Tsuyuki had worked with me in developing this uh, literally over 20 years ago. Um, and it's really unchanged. It is exactly the way it is now as it was then. And it's simply a matter of asking questions that sample each of these particular dimensions or domains that I was talking about. Um, from there, um, you can then uh, form a score. And I, I'll show you a little bit later how that works. Now, the next thing is that frailty is evident in the context of stress, um, acute illness in particular. This is actually one of the oldest models of frailty. It's the balance scale. And I've been talking about deficits. This is where the concept of deficits actually comes from and assets. And we would say that when a person is more robust, the number of assets that they have far exceed the number of deficits. So small stressors that come along on the deficit side are insufficient to tip them over. They remain functionally independent. Or in other words, uh, the example I used before, that small urinary or that urinary tract infection will not be enough to require a hospitalization. And a person who has developed frailty um, there are more deficits, there's fewer assets, they're more imbalanced. They may appear to be imbalanced and, and even um, independent, but now when you bring along that same stressor, it actually will tip the balance more easily and they require more care. Uh, surgeons uh, have had interest in this, in this uh, review. Um, uh, but in, in the, I can't remember the name of that, art, that journal actually, the Journal of the American College of Surgeons, I think. Um, you can see the robust state, there's this abundance of resilience, whereas as you move towards the more frail state, then there's substantial uh, stressors and depleted resilience. And this is a, a good way to think about it. Uh, the problem, of course, for surgeons, and this could apply to internists as well, say who are trying to make decisions about applying um, 
uh, certain therapies or procedures um, is that th you may not be able to tell who's robust and who's frail on the surface. And so you need a way to detect that frailty before you expose them to that stressor. Now, um, frailty, of course, is associated with adverse outcomes. I'm going to talk about the clinical frailty scale here. Went right back to one, uh, the original publication. You can see how these curves uh, separated. I, I don't show it, but each of these curves separates significantly from the next. And if you talk about survival over 70 months, these, that's a substantial difference between those that are in the ro more robust categories of one to three down to those that are uh, five, six, and seven. Uh, likewise, institutionalization, these curves also separate significantly, and uh, it's a very useful way to identify who may be requiring uh, care in 70 months. What's interesting, of course, is work that's been done here by Sean Bagshaw um, uh, a few years ago demonstrated a similar pattern for those people who are actually admitted to intensive care units, of which many actually live with frailty. And you can see just in terms of survival, there is significant separation of these curves as well. Uh, comparing those more robust one to three to those that are more frail six to eight. Uh, now, even looking at uh, decedent work, looking at people and, and patterns in the last year of life, um, you can actually see, this is a bit of a busy slide, don't get too lost with the colors, but they're comparing patterns of disability in the last year of life by uh, different um, diagnostic categories. So they group people according to cancer, dementia, organ failure, uh, frailty and other conditions. Um, so I think the first point is that um, frailty, as with organ failure, represents many different patterns of disability in the last year of life. And the second thing to note is that the number of decedents in the frailty category is higher than any other group. So it's just, just bringing to people's awareness that there are many people living with frailty, have that pattern of frailty in the last year of life, but we don't even have a name for it. We, we sort of dance around it and uh, we probably need to destigmatize it. Frailty for sure is a stigmatizing condition and people tend not to talk about it. And hopefully this brings uh, some awareness to the fact that it's a real phenomenon that needs attention. The model that I'm uh, proposing here is a simple one um, that focuses first on identifying cases. Uh, secondly, doing some form of multi-dimensional assessment and finally providing frailty inclusive care, all grounded on uh, sound ethical considerations. Let's turn our attention now and talk a little bit about COVID-19 uh, with that uh, background on frailty. Well, the first thing is uh, COVID-19 um, affects everyone, perhaps less so children, but as you can see, it certainly, this is Canadian data from yesterday uh, afternoon. Um, you can see that uh, all age groups, all adult age groups are affected. And so to that degree, um, this, we can't say that COVID-19 is particularly gerophilic, as they say. It's not a disease that is exclusively in older people. But as I'll show in a minute, um, we can say that it's gerolavic, which means it's harmful to older people, much more so than others. In fact, as I looked at this graph, I wondered, given the asymptomatic cases, which are more likely in younger age groups, perhaps uh, the younger people may be even more affected, a higher proportion than in, than in the elderly, but uh, that remains to be seen. Now, what about virulence, this gerolavic phenomenon? You can see here, um, this is again Canadian data, that if whether we look at hospitalizations or intensive care use, um, it likely is more virulent. Um, there's, this isn't pure virulence because there's obviously decisions that are being made about whether a person should be hospitalized or put into an ICU. But nonetheless, the, the age relationship is unmistakable. Um, if we look, uh, again, this is uh, Canadian data, not just at hospitalizations and ICU and looking at these different age groups, age 60 to 79 and 80 plus. Um, but if we actually turn our attention now to mortality, it's notable that 94% of the deaths in Canada are in the age groups that are 60 and above. And uh, I think most of us became aware of this, of course, with the uh, case fatality ratios that were coming out of China. Um, this study uh, demonstrated the very same thing. If we look at case fatality ratios, uh, very significant as we move up in, in that uh, higher age range, 60 to 69, 70 to 79, and over 80. Uh, 
This week, of course, has been a significant focus on what? On nursing homes. We've been hearing this in the news all the time. Teresa Tem, a few days ago, said that we know that close to half of the deaths that we are tracking are linked to long-term care uh, facilities. These deaths will continue to increase even as the epidemic growth rate slows down. Well, I'm not so sure that the epidemic growth rate has slowed down. I think that maybe a couple of days later it went up again, or maybe that's more testing. But nonetheless, I was interested this morning. I, I'm not sure if any of you are like me, but I still like to read the newspaper, the actual physical paper. <laughs> so I pulled out my newspaper this morning and was interested to see on the front page. Uh, it's not just nursing homes, it's palliative care and, and other facilities such as that. And if you turn a few pages into the first section, sure enough, it's home care as well. As John Hurdies has said, um, if you look at people who are living that are more vulnerable, they're not just in nursing homes, they're in the community. And in fact, there's probably more people that are vulnerable in the community than those that are in nursing homes. Um, so it's a, it's a problem that we can't sort of uh, pin down to just nursing homes. But the question is why? Why the hosp higher hospitalization, higher critical care, the higher case fatality ratios in older adults? Is it just their age? Um, hopefully at the end of today's discussion, I've convinced you otherwise. Um, what about changes in their immune system or immunosenescence? Um, that certainly is a possibility, but even review articles that I've read on COVID-19 would not pin this just to immune, immunosenescence and would talk about some of the other things I'm gonna mention here. Um, what about public health practices? That's certainly a factor. Um, it may be that, uh, especially as we look at nursing homes, um, that there were some mistakes that were made or maybe it's even the care where we sort of see that uh, some of the care, and I think there's a particular case in, in Quebec, an awful case um, where um, residents were actually uh, left to their own devices, um, the care was not there, and there were likely some deaths and fatalities as a result of that. So all of those things are, are factors and we'll understand those things um, over time. But what about the characteristics of the nursing home residents themselves? And that's where this talk is going. And what about some of the characteristics of others that are not in nursing homes, but that are likewise vulnerable? That's what the frailty discussion is all about. So I'd like to spend the rest of the time talking about these things. First, a little bit of time on advanced care planning, goals of care uh, designation conversations. I want to talk about care approaches during the acute illness itself. I want to talk about the problem of scarcity. It's an economic term, but uh, I think we'll all understand what that means pretty quickly. And finally, I wanna talk about frailty inclusive care strategies. Hopefully uh, by the time I'm done, I've covered um, the, the ponderous, the preposterous, and uh, hopefully the practical. So what about advanced care planning? Um, well, unfortunately we know that less than 20% of Canadians uh, have an advanced care plan in place. It may be better in Alberta, I'm not sure, but just to be clear, we're not just talking here about a goals of care designation. Uh, sort of a, a letter and a number. That's, that's useful to have in the context of acute illness. Um, advanced care plans are so much more than that. They are, uh, they're based on a full, converse, full conversation. Um, they talk about a person's values. They talk about the kinds of care that they want for their chronic conditions and how they, they want their life to play out. Um, there are excellent resources for this. If you haven't taken the time, I would strongly recommend that you do. Um, the uh, Canadian resource advancedcareplanning.ca is uh, highly recommended. Alberta has excellent resources as well. If you go on simply onto the HS website and search for advanced care planning, you'll find those resources. Just a few thoughts that I've had about how to elevate the conversations. Um, these are things that should be happening now not in the context of acute illness. I think that's one of the, the big points I wanted to make today is um, we should be sharing clinically relevant facts. Um, we shouldn't be talking about age. The preferences of the individual are absolutely paramount. And in most circumstances should, uh, sorry to use the word, but should trump all other considerations. And, uh, and finally, prognosis is better informed by frailty than by age. Now, if we're going to be talking about frailty, just a caution, I'm not talking about the score that you apply based on their acute illness in the moment. I'm talking about the score that you would apply based on their baseline, the way they were, say, two weeks before they became ill. Again, the importance of having these, uh, these conversations and, and letting um, frailty give context to the advanced care planning and goals of care designation conversations. <clears throat> 
there are excellent resources on goals of care uh, discussions, communication, and so on. Many of these are COVID specific and uh, have been posted on the HS website. I've highlighted them here. I, I'm pretty sure that you'll be unable to read them on your, on your screens, but I'll just say um, search COVID-19, search the word communication, um, and um, search the word uh, vital talk tips, and you'll find some of these resources, and they give you the words. They give you, it's very practical. If you're having this kind of a conversation, if they say this, you can say this. And so for those of you like me who sometimes need coaching on how to best have these conversations, I would strongly recommend that you have a look. Uh, and now is the time to do it and not uh, one, two, three weeks from now. Uh, here's an example of one of the tools that has been developed here in Alberta and that you'll find when you look it up on the website. Um, simply ask your patient if they have a personal directive goals of care designation in their green sleeve. Yes, no, go ahead and have a look. If yes, review it. Uh, just because they have one doesn't mean that they uh, want it to be the same now as what it was before. So there's always room for a new conversation and you can follow the algorithm through uh, on your own, but it gives you guidance on discussing the goals of care based on the information you have and then determining how to proceed from there. Now I wanna talk a little bit about some of the COVID screening tools that have been promoted. Here in Alberta, the CURB 65 has been mentioned several times. I think these are all good tools, but I just wanted to point out some of their limitations as well. First of all, um, these are the four that you might find if you look up um, like M MD, it's called MDscape or anyway, the, the, the app that provides these tools. Um, so some focus on uh, mortality and community acquired pneumonia, others focus more on mor mortality at 90 days, pneumonia severity or adverse outcomes. So you see they sort of focus on slightly different things. Almost all of them include aspects of the acute illness. Um, not all um, include a focus on underlying chronic illnesses. In fact, just one does. Um, some focus on the presence of acute confusion. And I'm pretty sure it's uh, acute confusion and not underlying cognitive impairment. And then there's a whole range of cut points for age. And so you can see the, the confusion that people might have. It's what is the, what's the cut point? So if you are intending to use age, uh, you might run into trouble. Everything from uh, 50, which I found shocking, uh, up to 80 and even 95 are used to, in different circumstances. Um, age is going to be problematic. Can't we replace age with frailty status? Well, maybe we're going to need to develop that tool because to my ex knowledge, there is no COVID-specific screening tool. Um, that includes a, a frailty score. But there is this, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in uh, the UK, NICE, did provide uh, guidance and did promote the use of frailty measures, specifically the clinical frailty scale, the one I showed you before. Um, they got a pushback very quickly after that um, from groups that represented the uh, disabled population, um, saying that they would be uh, unfairly uh, stigmatized, and I think it was a fair objection. And so they revised their uh, rapid guideline on the 27th of March, and, you, and it shows as you see it here. Um, so here we sort of ask the question about the cut point. Remember with the clinical frailty scale, the cut point that represents mild frailty is five or higher. So they use that cut point of five. Um, asking then the question about whether critical care is considered appropriate. This is where say the CURB 65 or another uh, COVID tool might be used. Um, and then moving forward from there um, to make decisions. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about the problem of scarcity. Um, hopefully with, this never happens. We've seen this happen in different places in the world, uh, New York City, Italy, uh, Spain, and so on. Um, but it is a reality. It's sort of uh, hiding in the background in our lives at all times. And the truth is that there is a gap uh, between the resources that we believe are going to always be there for us um, and the theoretically limitless wants that we have um, that may draw from those resources. And there are times when the resources are simply not enough. In, um, in the uh, Childers and Beauchamp thinking in, in uh, in ethics that we all learned in, in medical school, we talk about autonomy, uh, beneficence, non-maleficence, and we also talk about distributive justice. And so sometimes we have to make decisions based on what we have available. These are the sorts of decisions that have been made earlier on, for example, with technology such as dialysis. And um, 
And so some people, people like uh, uh, John Dosser, who uh, recently passed away, uh, were real pioneers in understanding how to apply limited resources um, in the context of scarcity. Um, and our own uh, Canadian Geriatric Society um, released a paper uh, recently that's available on, on our website, uh, 14th of April, 2020, that talked about this very problem. Um, they, one of the quotes, there's a critical ethical difference between decisions made on the basis of futility and those based on rationing. You see, futility is uh, probably more of a individually focused decision, uh, whereas rationing is probably a societal one, one that uh, has to bring in questions of scarcity. And as difficult as the conversation is, um, um, agencies that uh, represent uh, public funds do have to be thinking about rationing in extreme circumstances. I give one example here. I won't mention the, uh, the source. It's one of the provinces in our country. But you can sort of see how that, work, how that thinking works. So as the, you have that purple line that represents uh, the rise or the surge, and over time we move to different levels of capacity. Uh, moving beyond our normal capacity to minor surge, moving so 115% to moderate to even a major surge. Um, and of course, much of what's been happening in our, our public uh, preparations has been to prepare for this major surge. And in this kind of thinking, then they would apply different levels of triage that apply depending on the particular level of surge. Um, so in the level one, we would be starting to make decisions um, that would apply to those people who have a higher likelihood of death. So this is saying, yes, we care about their um, sort of the patient orientation and preferences, but at some level we have to make decisions when we have limited resources. So for example, level, level one might apply to those people who had an 80% chance of, uh, of mortality, level two to 50% and level three to 30% or something along those lines. And then in this particular model that I'm referring to, they would um, capture these sorts of things um, to make decisions about that predicted mortality. Uh, these are all things that make good sense, but I was interested to see that the clinical frailty score was included in this particular model. Wasn't quite happy with the cut points, but the, the thinking was good. Now, that's one way to look at it. Another is to say, what if we can actually identify frailty apply comprehensive geriatric assessment and reduce length of stay? What if we can apply frailty criteria, apply comprehensive geriatric assessment and keep people out of hospitals, identifying and addressing these problems in the community? Unfortunately, what we're seeing right now sometimes is the opposite. The, the community resources are limited. It's becoming more difficult to discharge and uh, sometimes more difficult to keep people out of hospitals. Um, that hasn't had a huge impact uh, yet because people are doing their best to stay out of hospitals, but you can sort of see the concept. Um, in this particular study, um, it was an RCT of uh, comprehensive geriatric assessment and, and what's called uh, optimizations, pre-surgical optimization in vascular surgery. And here they actually did see a significant difference in length of stay, um, delirium, medical complications, and uh, surgical complications and uh, delayed discharge. So another, that was from the UK. Here's another study that's called POSH. Um, they did the same thing, this time in elective abdominal surgery and found similar um, benefits in terms of length of stay um, and uh, readmission rates and so on. Um, two years ago, I was lucky enough to be asked to help with a, uh, the development of a clinical knowledge topic in Alberta um, on frailty in acute care. And this is one of the models that came from that. It would be tough for you to see but you can hopefully recognize the pattern uh, based on what I showed before, where you have case finding, defining components, and addressing components. And all of those have now been operationalized and built into an order set that now exists on Connect Care that's entitled Frailty. So you can see the idea here, as we had talked about the Edmonton Frail Scale, the Clinical Frailty Scale, and one day I hope we have built the EFI, the Electronic Frailty Index, into our system. That can help us define uh, frailty or not. And when frailty is identified, then there can be um, decision tools built into our electronic medical system that prompt people to consider doing other things, such as defining the components, following the, the, uh, the frailty order set and so on. Um, there may be circumstances where frailty is more complex and there's a need for referral to geriatrics, or if it's less complex, as is often the case, 
then teams are well suited. They're already well staffed to address the particular components um, that might exist. And I apologize. I, it's, it's not fair to give you information that you can't uh, read in full, but it'll be there in the slides. And like I say, this is all available in, in Connect Care if you have access to that under the uh, order set that's called Frailty. Um, then let's talk about that. So if I wanted to access and use the clinical frailty scale or the Edmonton Frail scale, how do I get there? Well, of course, uh, we're right in the middle of this uh, multi-stage launch of Connect Care. So only some who are now listening are already launched on Connect Care. Um, but all of you, regardless of where you are in the province, if you're listening from different places, will be happy to hear that AHS does have a license in place for both the Edmonton Frail Scale and the Clinical Frailty Scale. Um, this applies to in-scope care organizations such as Care West, um, Covenant, and so on. And the only difference here is that if you're using Connect Care, um, I'd suggest you simply go into the Flow Sheets tab um, and search under the Facility Preference list for the word Frail. And from there, you're going to find two versions, actually, of the Edmonton Frail Scale. I'll mention one in a second. First is the original one, the Edmonton Frail Scale, and the other is the EFSAC, which stands for Acute Care, which is actually the one that I'm promoting for our current circumstances. Um, the Clinical Frailty Scale is in there, and if you're patient within the next few days, it'll also appear. <laughs> For the present time, if you're keen to find it, um, you can look up the six minute walk test or six MWT and you'll find it at the bottom of the page there. So you can look at it there. Um, but uh, they, they've recognized that and they've actually been working to add it to the uh, facility preference list. For everyone else, um, we, we actually have a website and what we've done is there's a, a new section on that website that includes some COVID resources. And on there, you will find ways that you can access the clinical frailty scale and actually directly download the uh, EFS AC, uh, which has uh, been made uh, uh, free and available uh, worldwide actually in the, during the COVID time. This is what it looks like in the Connect Care environment. Um, you won't be able to see the full questions here, but you can sort of see that uh, just like the original EFS, um, there's two, it's all the same domains, it's the same uh, scoring um, strategy. Um, there's two items. The first one on cognition, which used to be the clock drawing test in the original, has now been converted to an interview-based format. And likewise, the last question, which used to be the timed up and go, has also been converted to an interview-based question. We did that because it's better suited to our current circumstance, where um, often people are assessing virtually. Um, and secondly, um, there may be an acute circumstance where we can't really rely on their functional performance in the, in the moment. Um, up at the top, you can see that if you hover over these items, then you'll get the full question. It will also appear on the right under the row information. Um, there's resource links that are available that will bring, bring you back to the Edmonton Frail Scale website. And at the bottom, when you get to the score, it'll actually show you how to interpret um, the Edmonton Frail Scale. So there's the, the cut points for each of the, the different categories. Um, this is the uh, Edmonton Frail Scale website that I was talking about. Um, when you look at it now, it will uh, it'll look a little bit different with a couple of orange boxes that will conveniently take you to um, the, the COVID uh, resources. We've also developed in just uh, last week, uh, thanks to the help of a uh, medical student that I work with, Hartley uh, Perlmutter, and uh, the Academic Technologies Group um, over the last year, um, we actually have this online course that's available. Only catches it's for the original EFS, not for the EFS AC. Hopefully that will come soon. But nonetheless, it's available um, and uh, uh, is currently under uh, license. Um, but since Alberta Health Services is under license, this link is actually being built into Connect Care. Uh, so people within Connect Care can access it that way. What about the CFS? Um, in Ottawa, they actually developed a, a really useful training module. It take, this one takes about half an hour. Um, if you wanted to uh, feel more confidence in, in your judgment with the CFS, I would highly recommend it. They give you a number of cases and then they, they give you a chance to sort of score them and then they tell you whether you got it right or not. And they're pretty strict. You, you have to be bang on with your, with your judgments and they'll give you the reasons why you're right or wrong. So this particular link is also worth looking at. 
Um, what about all of our order sets? Um, some of these are built into Connect Care, others are, are not. Um, the heart failure and COPD pathways, for example, have this curious phrase, physiotherapy and or occupational therapy referral, if positive screen for frailty and cognitive status. Well, what are we talking about? What's the screen? Well, that's one thing I hope you take away today is the idea that yes, there are two excellent frailty measures that you can use in these circumstances. We'll talk about cognition another time. I mentioned before uh, frailty order set. Again, if you look, look up frailty, you'll find this. It'll give you some general recommendations, evidence-based um, approaches to frailty. Probably the most important of these is exercise. Um, nutrition is, is also quite important, medication reviews and so on. Um, if you've done the Edmonton Frail Scale, you can actually take it further and look at the different dimensions. So the Edmonton Frail Scale will inform you on many of these different dimensions or components of frailty. And from there, if you identify problem areas, you can then uh, select one of those. And let's say that you see a problem with urinary uh, incontinence. You check that one off and it gives you a, a set of orders that you may or may not choose um, to, uh, to take to the next level. So that's available. This isn't an admission order set, by the way. It's something that might merge or be in, a, in addition to what you're already doing. Um, there's actually COVID order sets. Um, thanks to uh, Ben Sugars, I had a chance to provide a little bit of input on the adult admission order set, which has, as of now, been revised and actually includes recommendations to uh, perform a CFS or an EFS. And it's placed prior to the goals of care discussion and uh, thereby uh, it can be used uh, to also uh, lead you into using that frailty order set. I'm currently reviewing and we'll see if there's anything that uh, might, might be helpful with the ICU one as well. But I should say that um, the CFS has been used uh, by the critical care group for several years. They're way ahead of the rest of us. Um, it's been built into eCritical province-wide for uh, probably four or five years at least. And, uh, and so many of the intensivists are already familiar with and comfortable in using the CFS. I think we're just about at the end. I just wanted to talk about one particular caution, and that is the problem of labeling. Um, if we sort of look at our construct for frailty, physical, psychological frailty at the top there, we can dichotomize that and say, okay, well, we can objectively on the outside looking in say, yes, here's a person who is frail. So we start to use frail as an adjective saying that they, they are frail. The problem with that, of course, is that on the other side, the person who's living with that may never define themselves that way. Um, so um, if we start talking about them as being frail, um, they'll believe us and they'll start to identify themselves as frail. And unfortunately, when they do that, um, they're looking at the bottom right of this diagram. Um, as they self-identify, it actually can have some negative effects, uh, giving up, disengaging, and so on. It, both internally and externally, um, there are stereotypes that can be negative and actually can um, have exactly the opposite effect. On the other hand, strategies can be used to resist this kind of uh, identification. Um, just a couple of practical ideas here. I, as much as possible, I try not to use the term frail as a descriptor and rather say, talk about a person who's living with frailty. So it doesn't define their character. It doesn't define who they are. It is simply a, a health characteristic, like all the other health characteristics that we care about. So I, I'd sort of encourage everyone to try to talk about living with frailty. Uh, if you want to get away, away from the word frailty, you might talk about being less resilient or having less room for error um, compared to the way you used to be. So those colloquial terms uh, might resonate better and, and uh, might help us to resist um, some of the, the negative effects of stigmatization. Um, <clears throat> So just going to end with a, a quote by Ogden Nash. This is a quote I encountered when I was actually in my geriatric medicine residency training. And then I think we're open for questions. Um, people expect old men to die. They do not really mourn old men. Old men are different. People look at them with eyes that wonder when. People watch with unshocked eyes. Um, and then the, the classic ending but the old men know when an old man dies. So with that, uh, open to uh, questions. Thanks, Daryl, that was outstanding. Um, so we'll just go through the questions systematically. Um, you can go ahead and just post them in the question and answer box and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So the first one is related to studies in um, 
relating to isolation. So, isolation. so um, there was at least one prospective randomized trial and not others that have shown that physiological stress and uh, induced by social isolation leads to increased susceptibility to viral infections and even more severe consequences. So um, Dr. Lewanchuk asks, could this extreme social uh, distancing situation that we're in right now for frail and elderly, could it be contributing to the higher incidence or worse outcomes that we're mm -hmm. seeing? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a question that just makes the point with the question itself, doesn't it? Um, so older people are highly uh, dependent and interactive on others. So one of the characteristics of frailty is as people lose their internal reserve, they become increasingly dependent on external influences. So in the same way that um, external influences can be toxic or noxious, external influences can actually have the opposite effect. So that's one of the reasons why people are able to maintain their independence over time is because we provide that social context. Um, so yes, in a nursing home, these people become more isolated, but what about people in your neighborhood, right? Um, one thing that, uh, I'm, I'm glad Richard asked this question because Richard, I have to thank you. I think you inspired me to do this, but um, a couple of weeks ago, I thought, okay, that's it. I'm gonna walk around the neighborhood. I'm gonna keep my social distance. And I knew there was two people in my block who were older and didn't have any family. And, uh, and I, I left a note and made that connection just made sure they knew that if they need help, they can call on me. Um, so I think all of us can recognize that there are vulnerable people within our uh, communities who are in need of assistance. And not so much as uh, healthcare providers, but just as neighbors, we can do a great deal to be available to them, um, pick things up for them so that, that absolutely um, people are more vulnerable and that social context makes a big difference. So the next question is around long-term care facilities. And I guess there's been um, family members that have been asking about uh, the, the, how wise it is to bring family members home from a long-term care facility that they might be in right now. And what would your advice be around that? And then secondly, related to that, is um, what about, how would you handle that situation if you do decide bring, to bring an elderly loved one home in terms of, you know, ensuring that your home is safe and, you know, sort of uh, looking after all the, re making sure that they, you're following all the recommendations? That's a, that's a great question. Um, well, obviously, the first part of this is every circumstance is entirely different. Um, you have to look at the particular vulnerabilities of the individual and the resources of the place and uh, where, they're, where they're housed. Also, the regulations and whether it's even permitted. It may be that it's not even permitted. Um, I think at the present time, there's pretty significant restrictions. Um, but it may be that in some circumstances, it is allowed. So, so if it is... Um, then um, certainly it's it's a consideration. Um, they, if if there is a good relationship with the care staff, um, and uh, the family member feels that they are are getting good feedback, um, and the, you know the person's needs are being met, it's probably best to leave them in place, uh, at least for the next couple of weeks, and to use other technologies to interact with them. Um, if they are going to go home, let, let's say it's a situation where uh, there's a real worry about a potential outbreak. Um, I know of uh, several of my own patients um, where this has actually happened um, and family members have decided to bring them home. Um, in that circumstance, I, I would say keep in mind the, the value of structure. So people, especially people with dementia, they thrive on structure. They, they thrive on understanding what uh, is going to happen each day. And even though it may seem that it's in their best interest to remove them from that environment, you're actually taking them away from the structure that they have thrived on. So what I mean by structure is uh, regular timing of meals. Um, uh, now, some of that structure, of course, is lost with COVID because they may be more isolated. But nonetheless, at least there's people that they recognize. Um, so can you build that structure into your day? Um, if you're working at home, um, you may not be able to. Um, is your home... Um, uh, can, can you actually provide that routine? What about their overnight si situation, right? I mean, people in these uh, situations may be receiving care through the night. Are you able to provide that as well? So these are all considerations. It's a tough decision. Okay. Um, the next question is, uh, and this is a difficult one, um, we, we've all recognized that, you know, with the reduction in ambulatory visits and the fact that we know patients aren't coming into acute care, even if their um, chronic condition is sort of 
acting up a little bit. Peter Sr. is asking, how much mortality and morbidity do we expect because no one is having their chronic diseases monitored and looked after? Um, do we expect that this will be more than COVID? I, I, I suspect this is a hard question to answer, but I'll let you take a stab at it. I, I don't have an evidence-based answer for you, Peter. Um, I, I think, again, it's a, it's a question that makes a, an important point. Um, so I, I think that there will most certainly be um, some impact in that regard. Um, so the, in the same way that uh, the frailty model helps us under the understand the benefits of structure, the same thing applies to chronic diseases. So people who have chronic diseases, they thrive when they have regular contact. Um, and that contact, um, in many cases, does need to be in person, in group settings. And when we don't have the in-person and group settings and it's just by phone, it's just not the same. At the same time, um, I have been doing um, video conferencing uh, telemedicine for 20 years now. Um, I've been doing that probably two or probably twice a month with Grand Prairie and other places. And it actually surprises me how much I can accomplish over a video conference setting. Um, and the key for me always has been, do I have someone else that I can trust at the other end? So if I have another family member, I can actually coach them to do many of the things I might have done in person. Um, and so I would simply ask people uh, who are involved in uh, chronic disease management to sort of think outside the box and, uh, and ask yourself, is there something that you can accomplish over a, a video means or over a telephone means with uh, another person in place at the other end who can uh, act on your behalf? Um, I think uh, it's also worth mentioning that there are some concerns currently about um, video conferencing. Um, it's one thing for me to use uh, telehealth, but another to be using Zoom and all the questions about um, privacy with Zoom. Some of those have been addressed, but not all. Um, so uh, we would only sort of move from, say, a telephone-based to, say, a Zoom-based interaction if we felt that uh, the benefits outweighed the risks. Um. So just relating to privacy, I think uh, it would be important for people to just uh, make a note of uh, Dr. Yu's AHS CEO update. If you're getting that, there are some resources in terms of um, things to keep in mind with regards to our new reality, um, that although there will be some, some accommodations made, given that you know we're using telehealth, that we still need to keep patient privacy in mind. So there's some great resources um, in that um, update that we've also actually transferred onto the Medicine COVID website. Um, okay, the next question is, uh, so you talked a little bit about the Canadian um, sort of experience. Do we have a sense about other developed countries um, such as Italy, what criteria they use to make the difficult choices about resource allocation? Um, was it age or, or was it, you know, frailty indexes and, or even New York for that matter, I would say. It's a great question. I've actually been looking for that. Um, I must admit, I've been, I'm not sure if I'm like any of you, but I've been a little bit COVID obsessed and probably spending more time reading about it than I should online. Um, and this has been my area of interest. And so far, I haven't found much in either of those locations, Italy, or uh, New York or anywhere else for that matter, aside from the ones that I showed you from the UK with the NICE criteria where they're actually using frailty criteria. And even within the UK, although the NICE recommendations were there, I'm not really seeing frailty data being reported back. So I, I think this is quite new. Um, certainly people are using many of the, the COVID screening uh, tools uh, like Curb65, the other three that I mentioned there. Um, and I dare say that there will, there will certainly be places where they're using age criteria, um, and there will certainly be situations of ageism, um, although I don't want to be too critical because um, these are extreme circumstances and people sometimes um, not knowing where to go, they, they just make decisions based on what they do know. So. All right, and then um, Daryl, the last question that I, I have is, you know, you've talked uh, a little bit about sort of those discussions that need to be had with regards to frailty um, and, uh, you know, sort of advanced goal of, goals of care. And, and then at the very beginning, you talked about approximately 20% mm -hmm. of, uh, of the population um, actually go undergoing those discussions. So, you know, and, Acute care, we all agree, although there's great tools on, on that website in terms of how to have these discussions. 
um, you know, how do we promote this in the general community? Um, most of us that look after acute patients, our experience is that everybody comes in with these sort of assumed R1 goals of care. And, you know, it's, it's those difficult opportunities. And often the patient is too sick to actually have that conversation with or delirious or, you know, other situations. And so you're left with, with family members. And, you know, so how to turn that around? I, I wonder if you have any advice relating to that. Yeah. It's going to be all hard questions today. <laughs> yeah, that that is tough because, you know, we can all be experts, but then let's all ask ourselves, how have we been doing? Um, think about your own family members. Have you had that conversation? And how would you bring it up? Um, are you aware of uh, the circumstances with your parents, with your grandparents, with your uh, aunts and uncles and, and others, brothers, sisters? So um, one of the things that... Um, I think is helpful is um, number one destigmatization. So recognizing that um, you know frailty informs the conversation. Um, people don't want to talk about frailty, therefore they don't get into the conversation. They they sort of hit a dead end because they think it's all about age and it, it actually frailty function uh, comorbidities. Basically, the the real lives that we are living need to be destigmatized. Um, I, I think we all sort of remember. Uh, um, the book House of God, you know, and of course there's new versions of this now. I'm not sure if you've, what's it called? Um, uh, people talk about COVID-19 as boomer remover. <laughs> that, that's the newest version of House of God where people sort of stigmatize um, the discussion. Um, and that is very unhelpful. So um, that's the first thing is destigmatizing. The second thing is champions. And uh, there's a guy named uh, Duncan Sinclair, who's a retired uh, physician who um, was with the uh, Canadian Frailty Network. I'm not sure if it's still on the web page for the CFN, um, but he actually had a sort of a five point um, message. And one of his main messages was exactly what you said. It's um, advanced care planning. So I think the, the key here is we need to, older people need to be hearing from other older people and not just from family members. So are there, are there groups in the community that can promote this? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, family doctors, of course, are in a particularly useful uh, position. Um, just a little shout out to the group at the Oliver PCN. Um, Marjana Basi, Shani Kara uh, work there. And uh, any family doctors that are listening in should contact them and ask them for some of what they have done with advanced care planning. Um, they have a method that works um, within a family uh, medicine setting. And, and uh, you know, a family medicine group can actually look at their panel and actually have a, a quality measure, which sort of says, have we had the goals of care discussion? Have we had the advanced care planning discussion? And, and work through the list. And they can actually, as they do, use frailty criteria to identify who's most in need of that conversation. Okay, um, Daryl, thank you. That, that, that was an excellent presentation and I think very um, timely and appropriate and, and very, um, you know, sort of on point in terms of what we needed. So thank you very much. Um, so I just, uh, a couple of announcements. Number one is that um, we do have our Department of Medicine website, but as many of you have recognized that you do need special permission to enter that. If you have a U Alberta um, sign on, then, then that should be good enough. You'll be able to get in to that. And we are trying to keep it updated as much as possible, but there's also a link to give us some uh, feedback on how we can improve that. So please um, visit that. Um, the second thing is, um, these are accredited uh, rounds, so you can still collect your um, CME credits. I think there was an email sent last week in terms of how to go about getting a, uh, getting um, a, a, a credit, but um, if you go to the Department of Medicine website, then there's also information on how to get credit, and, and Andrea tells me that they're also going to send a, another email as a reminder. Lastly, um, next week, we have uh, the pleasure of uh, Dr. Vince Tai and Dr. DeCock um, presenting to us on the palliative sort of care aspects of COVID-19 management. And so hopefully um, you'll be able to join us. Thanks, everybody.